So friends, I'm recording this lecture with your permission. So friends, uh, welcome to this lecture on uh, John Locke. So our previous lecture was a reading of John Locke by Jeremy Waldron in the book Political Thinkers from Socrates to the Present, uh, which was edited by David Boucher and Paul Kelly. The reading gives us an impression that social contract theories are a particular way of interpreting how the idea of state originated in human society. And we are continuing the lectures on John Locke with a, an another reading. Today we will read chapter 12, Social Contract 2nd, the Lokian version. And this reading is taken from the book History of Political Thought by J.S. McLand. And tomorrow we will also talk about John Locke on the basis of reading of <clears throat> chapter 3, John Locke and Liberal Political Theory in the book. History of Political Theory and Introduction, Volume Second by George Klosko. So friends, McLand, which we are going to read today, <coughs> tell you that in the beginning, he draws a biography, a brief biography of John Locke before telling you the philosophy of John Locke that to understand any philosopher, it is very important that you begins from the biography of that particular philosopher. Making sense of the time is important to understand the philosopher. And in the beginning itself, in this reading, of uh, chapter 12, Social Contract 2nd, the Lokian version. In this section, J.S. Magland in the beginning will tell you that John Locke grew up, grew up with the 17th century scientific revolution. And as I told you in the previous lecture that he was in touch with Galileo, René Descartes and Isaac Newton. The point is that Locke was certainly a modern man. Locke was certainly a uh, modern man. Locke has published several books which I have already told you when we were talking about John Locke based on the readings of Jeremy Waldron. A letter concerning toleration 1689, two treatises of government 1689, an essay concerning human understanding 1690, thoughts on education 1693, on the reasonableness of Christianity 1695, However, friends, as I told you while talking about Jeremy Walton's readings, all these books, if you refer its timeline, were published only after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. But Magland will tell you that John Locke st started writing 
these books even before the glorious revolution he started writing these books a decade ago before the glorious revolution of 1688 happened and this delay in the publication of these books were particularly because of the fact that Locke suspected, feared an Indian cens censorship. He likely feared a, he feared a likely censorship because of the kind of arguments he proposed against absolute monarchy. Absolute monarchy in England. And which he feared that invite some kind of persecution by the British ruling monarchy. And friends, Locke was in the Oxford University. And in the Oxford University days, Locke was not in the beginning of his career in the Oxford University. Locke was not much concerned with political philosophy or nor political theory. But he was teaching some kind of laws and a lot of medicine. He was interested in medicine. And Macland, in this reading, which we are depending for today's lecture, tell you that in the biography part of this reading, that Loku was a bit of Tory, T-O-R-Y, Tory. And Tories believed that non-resistance, that is loyalty or obedience to established authority, obedience to established authority was the price of political stability. So if you want to have, if you wish to have a stable political system, you should be loyal to the political authority. You should not be a decent dissenter. You, you need not to be a you need not to rage a war against the political authority. You have to be a loyal citizen. And the price of that loyalty is stability of the political system. That is what Tories believed. But Maglan says that Locke's friendship with the first Earl of Shaftesbury, the Earl of Shaftesbury, changed Locke's worldview. And Locke, we will see later, changed from a dissident of Oxford Dawn to a troublemaker in the high politics of English society, British society. And he became advisor to highly placed plotters against the divine right of divine right of monarchy, the divine right monarchy of the Stuarts. And Locke supported intellectually those who plotted against the divine right theory of the Stuarts, that king's right comes not from people but from the God. And Locke objected to this idea and he served intellectually those who plotted against this version of the divine right of king. And Locke, in the beginning of his career, provided arguments with Shaftesbury, the Earl of Shaftesbury. He had a great friendship with the Earl of Shaftesbury. And he supported Shaftesbury in the everyday political battle against the Tory opponents. And as I told you, Tory never endorsed the idea of resistance to monarchy. So, probably, you know, Locke might have expected that Shaftesbury would ask you, Shaftesbury would ask Locke the most important political question of the day. Locke anticipated that uh, because of these kinds of, you know, battle between Tories and the weak and Locke supported Shaftesbury and Locke supported the Whigs and their cause and opposed the Tories. He expected a likely question from the Shaftesbury and what was the question? 
the question was that the grounds for the grounds for legitimate resistance to government how citizens should resist the government he expected that question from shaftsbury why would we rage against political authority why would we rage against the political authority and on what grounds citizens should rise against political authority and this type of a question Locke expected from Shaftesbury and friends in order to answer this question that Shaftesbury would uh, ask him some other days that it was presumed that and Maclean in this writing also underlined that uh, Locke has written the famous treaty, uh, treatise, the famous treatise, two treatises of government and Locke, Locke's two treatises was published to justify the glorious revolution of 1688. Locke published this book in order to support or justify, substantiate the glorious revolution of 1688. And I hope you may remember glorious revolution of 1688 from history classes, your readings in history classes, that it was a revolution, bloodless revolution in English history, result, resulted in the deposition of uh, James II and the accession of his daughter Mary II and her husband William III to power. Without any uh, bloodshed, England witnessed a change in guard in English society. And friends, in this uh, readings of Maclean about John Locke, Maclean begins his uh, writings with a comparison of philosophies that are influenced by other philosophies and he was trying to place Locke in a historical context and Maclean talks about one philosopher uh, who influenced another philosopher's conclusions and in that case Maclean was referring to Plato who influenced Aristotle's conclusion or Maclean placed in question another relationship between philosopher that is one philosopher who comes to his political conclusions through another's political conclusion here he was referring to the relationship between Marx and Hegel but when it comes to John Locke two very powerful and influential political philosophies Locke might have been influenced might, uh, 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 the, these philosophers probably would have influenced the Locke where Thomas Hobbes and Sir Robert Filmer. But you know, Maglan says that Locke was never influenced by Thomas Hobbes, a stalwart of his time, and Sir Robert Filmer. Filmer. None of them, according to Maglan, influenced Locke, and Maglan says. Locke had his own standing in the political philosophy that he proposed. And Maglan says in this reading that uh, Locke even attacked, intellectually attacked Sir Robert Filmer who lived in between 1588 and 1653 and who was an English political theorist and he was famous for an idea of the uh, the divine right of kings. So Robert Filmer was famous for the idea divine right of kings. That kings right to ru rule was granted by the God, not by the people. So he is answerable to the God, not to the people. That was the idea of divine right of kings. And Sir Robert Filmer substantiated this argument by referring to Bible and other relevant historical data. And some, uh, Robert Filmer's famous book, Patriarcha, was published posthum posthumously in 1680. And this book was, Patriarcha was a target of numerous attacks by the Whigs. And particularly 
जेम्स टिरल और अलगर नॉन सिडनी एंड इंक्लूडिंग जॉन लॉक दिस पीपल हैव अटैक्ट इंटेलेक्चुअली द पाट्रियार का ऑफ सर रॉबर्ट फिल्म इट इज इजी टू रीड लॉक्स सेकेंड रिटाइस ऑफ सिविल गवर्नमेंट as a straight attack on thomas hobbes we know that the two treatises of government got two parts the first treatise and second treatise and the first treatise of course was an attack on sir robert filmer and the second treatise was of course an attack on thomas hobbes that means you know friends uh, his relationship with these two writers were not the kind of relationship that we can expect from plato and aristotle and hegel and marx Locke began his political career of political philosophy by attacking Sir Robert Filmer and uh, Thomas Hobbes. And he attacked Sir Robert Filmer in his first treatise, uh, first treatise of uh, civil government. And what he attacked? Sir Robert Filmer. in his patriarcha or the natural power of kings proposed a systematic exposition uh, that was available till date in the english speaking world which just came to be known as the divine right of kings and locke by organizing a staunch attack against sir robert, robert filmer and lock started his attack on robert filmer right from the book of genesis a part of the old testament bible lock said the book of genesis does not actually say that god gave the world to the adam to rule god according to lock did not give adam the right to rule adam is never referred to as a king in the book of genesis then how could sir robert filmer say that kings got their right to rule right from the god no it's absurd locke says there is no biblical evidence that adam really was the king by god's appointment genesis the book of genesis makes no mention of the kingly rights of adam and the sons of adam then there is no no evidence that you know the book of genesis makes a reference to the kingly rights of adam's sons so lok want to argue lok want to argue that in the second treatise to argue in the uh, lok want to argue in the second treatise that everyone including the sovereign everyone including the sovereign needs to come into the civil society and sovereign included are obliged to obey law then including the sovereign should obey law that means sovereign is not above law but when we read thomas hobbes and his leviathan we will come to conclusion that sovereign is not a party to the contract and he is above the law and the law is the command of the sovereign but when it comes to locke he never supported that idea in his second treatises and sovereign is also a party to the contract the idea was clear friends lok want to establish a limited government lok want to establish a limited government and lok was attacking thomas hobbes argument that all men except one come out of the civil society and form a contract thereby elect a ruler and ruler is still in the state of nature who never come out of that and all people who come out of the state of nature 
will elect the ruler as uh, a lawmaker and this lawmaker will enforce laws which he himself promulgates and lok says this is historically absurd idea it's you know unthinkable so that you know friends lok was trying to propose a new kind of uh, social contract theory he was trying to propose a new kind of social contract theory as we have talked in the last lecture of john lok by jeremy waldron uh, jeremy waldron tell you that every contractual thinker every contractual thinker makes a proposition first about human situation human situation which existed prior to the political society there is a situation uh, prior to the political society and according to social contractualist that situation is called state of nature that you already know by reading jeremy waldron second the contractualist after proposing a state of nature condition also proposes some statements about human nature and finally they will propose their position about why a stateless situation persuaded people to leave state of nature and to form a political order this is the kind of arguments proposed by all the social contractualists including the recent one john rawls so the point is that as jeremy walton has mentioned in the previous reading in our previous reading that every contractual thinker is different in terms of their interpretation they propose as i told you based on our reading of jeremy walton propose a specific interpretation of state of nature that is unique to every uh, social contractual thinkers second they propose a specific interpretation of human nature third they propose a specific interpretation of the forms of government that is useful that is required to overcome the difficulties in the state of nature so the kind of state a social contractualist devises is based on the kind of his interpretation of human nature and state of nature so these are connected that's why hobbes proposed a specific kind of social contract theory and locke here proposed a different kind of social contract theory and jas maglanch in this reading which we are discussing now clearly underline this line of thought associated with social contractualist and the most famous sentence according to maglanch in the second treatises is that is this one though this put in bracket the state of nature though this that is the state of nature be a state of liberty that all of you have liberty in the state of nature yet it is not a state of license that means you are in state of nature in a perfect liberty but it doesn't mean that you have license to do everything that you like lock state of nature is recognizably social right uh, but when it comes to thomas hobbes his state of nature is pre social and pre political there were no society there were no political order in the state of nature of thomas thomas hobbes but friends when it comes to john locke maclan will tell you that it was recognizably social even if, even if it was pre political that the society had no a political arrangement but the society had a social arrangement it was a social uh, you know you know people were sociable that's why lock statement that state of nature is a state of liberty not a state of license because people were social it will become become a license in the scheme of thomas hobbes because there were there were no society at all but in the philosophical position of lock that even in the state of nature people were social that's why even though you enjoy liberty people never consider that their liberty is a license to 
do anything that pleases them that people had a sense of duty also so that's why you know people began to respect the rights of other people that's why Locke gives emphasis more emphasis to the idea of uh, rights it's very important to understand the idea of rights in john locke because all his scheme of thought is centered around his notion of rights but that is not seen in the writings of thomas hobbes fear is the you know central idea of thomas hobbes leviathan but when it comes to john locke's treatise on government you will see that natural right is the center pillar upon which his entire uh, political philosophy revolved around by natural right locke means that entitlement under natural law a natural law is god's law natural law is law that is existing in the society even before we created a political society there must be some kind of natural law that existed here even before we created a political society and this natural laws that existed even before the political society gives us certain rights and friends god according to law did not create the world we have that we are in now and god created the world we are in now and the people in it for nothing god has no any purpose for creating the world we have now and the people in it because he certainly wanted men to get their sustenance but even though god did not create the world and the people in it god certainly wanted to god certainly wanted men to get their sustenance god certainly wanted the men to get their sustenance which means that god intended men to live and to live as long as it pleased him men can live in this world as long as it pleases him but you know according to his, according to locke's interpretation of genesis the book of genesis the bible the old testament in the book of genesis in the original natural state his original natural state the garden of eden the garden of eden adam and eve did not have to labor for their sustenance adam and eve did not have to labor for their sustenance why because they were posted in the uh, eden garden of eden and god intended them to leave the land as contented vegetarians right in the book of genesis according to locke's interpretation god never intended adam and eve to labor uh, and work for their sustenance rather they were put into the eden as vegetarians and there were enough fruits but the point was that according to locke's interpretation adam and eve rebelled against the god they rebelled against the a god and the age the tree of the knowledge the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they make they began to make sense of what is good and what is evil and they invented sexuality and according to christian belief sex is sin and adam and eve invented sex so they were that's why expelled from the garden and ever since they were expelled from the garden by the god trouble started in human society and when they expelled from this uh, you know eden garden there were no political society the eruption of desire in men the eruption of desire in men men that here after once they are expelled from the garden they would have to get their bread in their sweat right once god expelled from uh, expelled adam and eve from the garden both of them had to 
struggled for their bread. But in the Eden, they need not to struggle for the bread. Because in God's scheme, they were allowed to have enough of what they need. But once they are expelled, they had to labor for their bread. They would be obliged to pluff, sow and reap the land. They would be obliged to pluff, sow and reap the land. So, but you know, God, according to Locke, uh, was extremely angry. Uh, God was, you know, extremely angry at the fall of man from the garden. Because they rebelled against the God. Uh, but, you know, uh, God was merciful. God was a repository of, you know, love. So the merciful God offered man an opportunity to get their bread through useful uh, labor. And he, he offered, and he even offered women the chance to bear children through labor pain. Therefore, it followed that men had a natural right to labor and a natural right uh, to the land they tilled and to its produce. See how look at the argument he was trying to propose. He was very tricky in his you know you know arguments. He was uh, he was trying to uh, propose this theory in a convincing manner. That why that's why friends he was saying that men had a natural right to labor and the natural right to the land they tilled and its produce which later became uh, their right to property according to Locke. From this persuasive account of origin of human society uh, based securely on God's own word that is holy scriptures Locke derives friends a fairly sophisticated uh, a fairly sophisticated theory of natural rights, particularly the natural right to property. So the natural rights, Locke thinks are of three, which we have already discussed in the previous lecture. The right to do life, liberty and property. The right to life, liberty and property. First, am I audible, friends? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. And man's reason—that's man's natural reason. Locke says that uh, man got a natural reason, even if they are expelled from the air. Then, man got a natural reason. And this natural reason tells him that these rights are very important for his sustenance, for his survival as a human being. And these rights are very important for the fact that all men have the same right. All men have the same right to uh, life, liberty and property. Second, once they are expelled from Eden and they have a notion of natural right, and they believe that all men have the same rights. That means man by nature got a social character. Locke believes that man by nature got a nature got a social character. That's why they are able to respect the same rights of other people. And they also have a sense of duties because once you have a right, man should also develop a sense of duty. Uh, right without a corresponding duty. Is a privilege rights if you have rights but without duty that means it becomes a privilege uh, for example uh, you are doing uh, you have a salary but no work duty are associated with it just like that you know you have salary but no duty your teachers are paid by the government but they are not you know delivering lectures just like that right so uh, if you have a right you will also have to perform certain duties that's what Locke says. And men have this idea. That's why Locke says in the state of nature, uh, prior to the birth of, you know, what may be called political society or civil society, according to John Locke. Locke says, man created a civil society through a contract. Uh, you know, you know, men were sociable. 
So rational men are capable of working uh, this idea for themselves and easily they are able to recognize that all the men have natural rights and all the men need to respect the natural rights of other people. All the men need to respect the natural rights of other people. And this reciprocity of natural rights that I respect your right and you respect my rights. So uh, that way, you know, this reciprocity makes men social in the state of nature. So therefore, let's say state of nature could be social even if their sense of natural rights were not harmonious. Then I have my perception of natural rights and you have your perception of natural rights and our perceptions were not harmonious. But we know that you have natural rights and I have natural rights. But the point was that Locke was a little bit skeptic in the sense that my perception of right of always come in conflict with your perception of right. And friends, in that situation, you know, in the state of nature, there were no an agency to arbitrate between you and me. That is a problem in the state of nature. That's why Hobbes, uh, Locke says that uh, even though their perception of rights were not harmonious, even though there were occasional violations of natural rights, men were a bit social. That's why Locke says that, you know, uh, in the state of nature itself, men were able to make contract because of their sociable nature. But when you go to John, Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan, Locke uh, Hobbes says that, you know, men were not social. That's why first they come out of the state of nature and drop all their claims to natural rights and form a contract and each individual makes a contract with every other individuals. But Locke says within the state of nature men were able to make contract because his nature was social. So that because he had a sense of rights and he respect the same rights of other people. This is his notion of natural rights, which, you know, MacLeod uh, uh, read in his writing. And Locke says, state of nature and government, they both are connected because the kind of government, MacLeod says, which Locke proposes is in tune with, is in line with the kind of state of nature he imagined. You look. The state of nature and government are, you know, complementary. And the state of nature of Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan are complementary. Because in Thomas Hobbes, a strong, powerful Leviathan is required because humans are inherently, uh, you know, you know, uh, warring, a war of all against all. That is the situation in the state of nature. But when it comes to Locke, you know, uh, you don't need an all-powerful government. Why? Because we are all social. We respect the rights of other people because we are social. So they are connected in Locke, just like it is connected in Thomas Hobbes. Locke says, man should not be, we need not be over grateful to the government. We need not to respect unnecessarily the idea of government. Why? Because we may uh, perhaps go back against the state of nature when the government, you know, violate uh, our trust. When the government break the trust, we will, uh, you know, you know, you know, we will abolish it and go back to state of nature. So you need know, to give unnecessary, uh, you know, uh, you know, gratitude to the idea of state. Second, unlike societies, you know, state. State is not part of the given things. State is not part of society. Societies, that is economics and social system, arise spontaneously and naturally. That is society and economics uh, emerge naturally. But state do not. State is not God given. In God's scheme of things, there is no idea of state. Adam and Eve were expelled from the Eden Garden and they were despised by the God, but he was merciful. He was, uh, he was loving. That's why in his love, uh, you were, Adam and you were allowed to pluff in their land, uh, sow in their land, land 
and uh, you know harvest in there uh, harvest the crops in their lands and they were allowed to make claims on the land they tilled but you know in that scheme of things the book of genesis there is no reference to the idea of state and men have no idea of state in the origin in their origins and state was invented later at some points of time so late state was an invention by man it was not in his nature it is not god given third is that state is there for a purpose it got only a, a specific purpose that's why we created a uh, state and we have to maintain state only for the purpose for which it was created see look at the kind of argument he proposes state is not like society state is created for a specific purpose and you have to maintain state only for those purpose for which it was created right and what is the purpose we all know that to protect our natural right that when there is a conflict between my perception of right and your perce perception of right we need an arbiter a judgment and this judging authority is the state and should be an impartial agency to judge between my claim and your claim and that is the only duty of the state and men who enjoy natural rights in the state of nature men who enjoy natural rights in the state of nature would plainly have to consent maglan says uh, you enjoy uh, natural rights in the state of nature and you will give consent to setting up a, a government that means your consent is very important to form a government that's why uh, in law the very notion of the theory of consent begins here you can see the notion of consent that's why you know friends there is a natural limit on government government is based on the consent if there is no consent there is no government so he proposes a very limited government that that you know uh, state cannot violate the consent and finally society is natural while the state is artificial society is natural when state is uh, artificial society as i told you arises spontaneously and society is prior to the state both logically and as a matter of history as a matter of history and by logic when you look at society it is prior to the state but you know aristotle or plato never agree with that idea even uh, you know aristotle says man by nature is a political animal state is a natural institution it was state police that emerged first all things are secondary according to the ancient greek uh, you know you know classical writers but when it comes to law society was you know uh, it was a scheme you know uh, that begins from the genesis so society existed prior to the state and men know what is society from the beginning but they don't know what is state in the beginning state was a later invention in human society so society is what god's meant it to be society is what god meant it to be that capitalist and naturally harmonious society is according to law is capitalist and harmonious so friends from this point maglan invite you to have a sense of uh, the social contract so maglan says that social contract of law is an extension of the pre existing uh, so uh, morality that the uh, morality existed in the society what is that morality that i know that what is your right and you know that what is my right that is um, we have a morality that you know we respect each other and the contract is an extension of that morality according to locke that morality being our sense of natural right which men recognize and respect for each other at the moment of contract when we when i and you enter into a contract to form a uh, political system we give up only the absolute minimum we give up only the absolute minimum we drop only the absolute minimum but when it comes to hobbes you remember hobbes men leave off all the claims to their natural rights and they migrate to a political society but you know when it comes to law they leave absolute minimum 
and tries to gain the maximum make the maximum gain for making the maximum gain they leave only, uh, the absolute minimum they enter the stage very limited power what is that power just interpret natural right just protect natural right once it is violated that is the only function of you know uh, you know you know stage uh, rest of the things belongs to the uh, humans uh, what we enjoy in the society prior to the birth of stage is still there why we created stage we created stage just to protect what our natural right rest of the things belongs to us all our notions all our ideas all our possessions belongs to us a state is there just to protect our claims so in lok account when the government you know uh, lok says when and why the government collapse uh, government may collapse it may collapse when it violates men's natural right when it violates men's natural rights and men are justified friends men are just you are justified to rebel against the government you are justified to rebel against the government when when uh, you know you know government betrays your trust when government betrays your trust when government misuse your trust you are allowed to revolt against the government but friends this is not possible in the social contract theory of thomas hobbes and magland categorically says that you know law allows men to men a right to rebellion and even perhaps a moral duty you have a moral duty to rebel magland says according to interpretation of magland a uh, law you know entitle you a right to rebellion it said your duty sometimes you have a moral duty to rebel the government if the government begins to frustrate god's purpose for the world you see and you see uh, here your law is in a sense substantiating capital punishment why you know you can see that you know a law is ruthless uh, about non joiners ruthless about non joiners that uh, i join the civil society you join the civil society but the third person is not joining the civil society what happens if that third person is still not joining and he makes a claim about right his own perception of right which come in conflict with the, my perception and your perception but he is not joining the civil society what happens you know when a third person is not joining the civil society lok says friends kill them kill them that's what he says you know in the beginning non joiners may be killed why they are killed because that third person is denying god's law what is god's law god's law entitled you certain rights and that right is your right to life liberty and property and a non joiner a third person is not joining you your club that means he is still there to make trouble and he is not troubling just against you he is troubling against god's wishes because god's wishes was your uh, natural law and that natural law entitled you certain rights and he is that third person is rebelling and that person may be uh, killed that's why you know you can find the first intellectual endorsement for capital punishment in the modern day begins from john locke a man who violates another's natural right by taking your life or threatening you that man is irrational and he is hardly a man at all he has no natural reason his reason doesn't function and he should be killed that's what locke says if a man breaks god's law in the civil society he is no better than a wild beast and may be killed and friends another point suppose you are the social contract and you have entrusted an authority to judge your claims of right and other persons claim of right but you know friends once after a particular point of time you are going to withdraw from the consent what happens locks think that uh, you know you know you know uh, that the if i fail to 
obey the law because i would i would i would feel i am not comfortable with the concern i have given to the civil society but you are still supposed to obey the law even if you have withdrawn from the uh, social contract you are still supposed to obey the law because why even when a law makes a case of a stranger in a foreign land you are visiting an uh, america or england for example and you go there you have to respect the laws of that nation right you have to respect uh, the laws and the norms in that nation for example just like you visiting your friend's house uh, a guest are obliged to follow the habits and custom customs of that family where you visit uh, of course your habit and custom may differ uh, from their habits and customs in their house but you are supposed to obey their customs and uh, their habits when you are in their home just like that even if you withdraw from the concern you are still uh, even if you are still a stranger you know you are supposed to uh, follow the laws in that prevailing in the civil society that's what log says about the nature of the contract and maclean invites your attention to the form of the government that is the result of you know uh, uh, the contract and uh, later uh, for shortage of time you may read that section that's the last part of uh, maclean's writing the form of government as well as you know uh, the problem of liberty under law and he also talks about concern the notion of concern and also finally he talks about the foundation of liberalism in this writing so a uh, few more points uh, that is uh, maglan tell you about uh, the form of government which is the best form of government uh, that will protect your natural rights and he has some uh, points maglan has some points to tell you about the form of government in the social contract of law as well as uh, what happens to your liberty once you are under a law because you are uh, giving you uh, the right of interpretation of natural rights to a uh, an arbiter which you consented to form through a contract what happens to your natural liberty which you got right from the book of genesis and uh, lock has a scheme of things which uh, macland tell you in that right in the in his readings and also he talks about the idea of consent uh, in the last part and finally he talks about the foundation of liberalism lock was supposed to be the founder of modern uh, liberalism uh, and modern ca the capitalism and modern the notions of you know private property holdings this idea comes from uh, lock and uh, liberals are always in, in uh, grateful to Th john lock they are fond of you know john lock for proposing these kinds of uh, capitalist liberal notion of uh, uh, social contract and friends uh, which i request you you may come across that readings friends uh, that's all about uh, you know you know this lecture on you know readings of uh, you know uh, chapter 12 social contract second the lokian version from the history of political thought by js macland uh, friends you can have questions friends please sir 